Good morning, Sacramento. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this is All Things Legal. My name is Craig Ashton. We're on Money 105.5, the Wall Street Business Network. Essentially, this is where curious personal injury attorneys distill topical events into their legal essence. What does that mean? Well, we're uh, Ashton & Price, which is a personal injury law firm, but uh, ultimately, uh, we're curious and we like to read. So in our off time, uh, we uh, listen to the radio. I like to listen to NPR. Uh, I like to watch CNN. Fox News is on uh, Ed's uh, uh, station, so we're fair and balanced here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I went to UC Berkeley. Ed's from Orange County. So uh, ultimately, we, we kind of break down topical events, and t- today is no different. Uh, we kind of drill down. Uh, the interesting thing is, is, is most uh, articles that you read usually have a legal underpinning. Um, many of them do, at least. And so what we do is kind of drill down a little bit below the surface and, and kind of uh, give you a historical framework, a foundation from a legal perspective, uh, hopefully to make uh, this hour very interesting for you, but it, at the very least improve your Jeopardy game. Today I am joined by my colleague in uh, profession and also my colleague as an Ironman, Ed Shady. Go. Uh, good morning, Sacramento. Pleasure to be here. Uh, and we always say this is the time you want a shady attorney on your side. Uh, he's been practicing law for uh, over 20 years, uh, dozens of uh, trial attorney uh, trials under his belt, a uh, great uh, civil attorney, and uh, he uh, brings a unique uh, insight uh, from his Orange County roots. Hey, got to love Orange <laughs> County. I think it's going to be 23 years this year. Yeah, 23. This is my 23rd year as well. I think there 24. Um, so uh, Ed decided, uh, based upon a level of insanity that is unusual among those who uh, uh, are uh, kind of hail from Orange County, but you signed up for Ironman Mallorca. Uh, yeah, I don't think it was anything to do with insanity. I think it was a cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a libation, one might say, in Orange uh, that, County. That's, that's how I got started uh, <laughs> with a, uh, a very fine Cabernet about six years ago uh, being talked into Ironman New Zealand uh, with essentially only a half marathon under my belt. And uh, I, I remember going home and I was going through a remodel. Uh, I had a partition down the middle of my house. I had three greyhounds, uh, essentially um, a bachelor at that time. And uh, thinking to myself, you know, I've got a very large law firm that we run, going through a massive remodel with uh, a partition down the middle of my home with three greyhounds. And the only thing that was giving me cold sweats was the idea of 140.6 a triathlon in uh, Lake Taupo, uh, New Zealand. So hey, it was Got to admit, man, when you're going through a you know, remodel at the house, anything to get you out of the house is a good <laughs> That's idea. So exactly. And training for the Iron Man is not yeah. a bad idea. It keeps you in shape, <laughs> keeps you focused, and keeps you out of the construction. And we're usually joined by uh, Tim Hodson, who provides uh, the dulcet baritone tones to this uh, particular show, but he's uh, at a uh, settlement conference today, so uh, he's trying to resolve a case for one of our clients. So I think that is time well spent. Tim, good luck, and uh, we'll see you around lunchtime. All right, so let me, let me kind of break down what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we've got a unfortunate uh, Greyhound bus accident that happened in Gilroy uh, this week on Tuesday. Uh, killed two people and left uh, about uh, 20 passengers or the remaining passengers injured uh, to uh, various degrees. And so we'll talk about the law of negligence. Then we'll talk about the different rules that apply to common carriers. Uh, the Greyhound bus driver is working for a common carrier, which is Greyhound Bus. And over the years, common carrier has been a foundational kind of different standard based upon the fact that if you're going to take the responsibility to drive somebody, either in a horse and buggy uh, or, a, or a bus or a train, et cetera, uh, you must use the highest care and vigilance of a very cautious person, which is slightly different than reasonable care of, a, of an average uh, objective uh, uh, citizen. And then we'll also uh, kind of go through some of the statistics for tire driving. Um, according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, uh, there were 1,550 deaths uh, in, uh, I think, 2013 uh, as a result of tire driving, 70, 71,000 injuries and $12.5 billion in monetary losses. So we'll kind of talk about tire driving, the Greyhound bus and common carriers, and the law of negligence. Uh, we'll go ahead and talk about Sacramento approves restrictions on short-term rentals such as Airbnb. Uh, and actually, the restrictions are endorsed by Airbnb. And we'll talk about the Tenth Amendment and zoning laws, the taking clause of the Fifth Amendment. And we'll talk about uh, how ultimately Sacramento is well within the confines to kind of restrict uh, this particular behavior as long as it's not uh, content-based. Uh, First Amendment. So in other words, sometimes there are cases with billboards that say, you know, you can't have this billboard up. 
you, you can't do it based upon content, but you can do based upon shape, design, location, et cetera. So we'll talk about what's going on with Airbnb and how we think probably from a legal perspective, this is 100% uh, legal and it's probably good for Sacramento because it kind of provides some rules. Correct. Uh, we stayed at an Airbnb uh, in Barcelona. It was called uh, Cal, uh, Cal de Strat, which is a, a little tiny kind of medieval town. Cool thing about uh, Spain, especially when in, you get to Catalonia, um, I took one for the team, and I rented a nine-passenger van, which <laughs> everybody in, in uh, Europe pretty much drives a smart car, right? So I, I've got this massive van. It's red, rojo, and uh, I, a couple times I'd be driving, and I would look in the rearview mirror and think I'm being followed, but it was actually the van I was driving. And so the nice thing is is that you're on these uh, really nice toll roads, and the great thing is my girlfriend Tanya speaks Spanish, um, so anytime I would get myself a little bit turned around, she would kind of get me out of that situation. But you're driving on these beautiful tow roads, super wide, four lanes, five lanes, and then you get off to Caldestat, and then now you're getting into maybe a 11th century little, you know, kind of medieval town. And so you go from these massive uh, toll roads to <laughs> these narrow cobblestone, cobblestone crazy right? Lord of the Rings type, you know, where the, the, the doors are, you know, four feet tall, 12 feet tall, the, the windows are all different sizes. And then, you, you know, you've got one-way streets that you're dealing with, and so it gets a little, little bit uh, crazy. Well, maybe it wasn't zoned for a van. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'll tell you. I learned a lot about my driving skills, and I, I'm pretty calm under pressure, especially in a – because you, when, when you're driving the wrong way uh, down a medieval road in Spain as an American tourist in a bright red massive van – um, he's kind of stand out a little bit. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> so I told everybody I was Canadian. All right, so then uh, let's go ahead and talk about uh, – we'll, we'll talk about the Airbnb. Um, the reason I brought up Spain is Airbnb was awesome there. We had a great time, uh, you know, an a, a amazing value, beautiful place, uh, unbelievable views. Airbnb is a great company, 100% endorsed it. My experience was awesome. Um, we'll go ahead and talk about a lawsuit that's blaming Twitter for an ISIS terrorist attack. Uh, I think this is pretty interesting. Um, a 46-year-old contractor, Lloyd Carl Fields, was killed in Jordan, and his widow is suing Twitter, saying, look, you're providing a platform for ISIS to advertise. I just saw this thing on Instagram. They have this thing called Jihatis, H-O-T-T-I-E-S, which is these women dressed all in black, you know, with a full uh, face covered, but, you know, blowing off AK-47s on Instagram <laughs> to recruit uh, women to go join the caliphate in um, Syria and parts of Iraq uh, to join ISIS. So the idea is is that the the law really has not evolved, I think, enough to start talking about this. Because in 1996, we passed the Communications Decency Act, which basically uh, it, 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 it immunizes Twitter, Instagram, Facebook from any responsibility because they're not responsible for content. And so Twitter and Instagram and Facebook are being used by these groups, and they're, they're saying that they're trying to take care of it, the, the individual companies, but they're saying we don't have resources to monitor everything. Well, the point is if you're using our technology and, and the Internet that was developed primarily in this country and much of it by taxpayer dollars, should we continue to immunize a group that a company is making billions of dollars when their platforms are being used to recruit people that are trying to kill American citizens? And the idea is, has the law evolved enough? Um, one of the reasons I think we have issues is we've got people that are in the Senate. Uh, this is Ted Williams, uh, uh, Ted uh, Stevens That's, from Alaska. Yeah. And uh, this is what he said about the Internet. There you go. So, so, yeah, so, he, so basically th this is someone in the Senate that was responsible for some of our Internet policies. And that was 2006 when he uttered those words, thinking that the Internet is a series of tubes. So the point is, is one of the reasons we might not have the right laws in regards to the Internet is a lot of people don't understand the technology. And I think we'll have a discussion about whether or not we should maybe extend some responsibility to platforms that are being used to recruit ISIS. Last thing we'll talk about is ExxonMobil. Uh, they are look, uh, being looked in by Camilla uh, uh, Harris, who's our attorney general in uh, California, as to whether or not they committed ser securities fraud uh, when they had uh, some research knowing that uh, climate change w was real and they didn't disclose that to their investors. So hopefully you find that interesting. And when we come back from the break, we'll go ahead and uh, talk about uh, common carriers and the Greyhound bus. All right. So we're back. The show is all things legal. Money 105.5, the Wall Street Business Network. Uh, this is where, as I say, curious personal injury attorneys 
distill topical events into their legal essence, and today's no different. Um, I, I said before we took the break, we'd talk about the Greyhound bus, but I, I kind of want to talk about uh, this ISIS lawsuit, which I, I think is really interesting. The first lawsuit of its kind. And when I first heard about it, I said, you know, just on the face of it, I don't think that's going to have some legs. And, and it may not, uh, based upon some pretty straightforward law and language in the Communications Decency Act of 1996. But let's kind of just break this down from a perspective of the law and perspective of kind of societal responsibility, uh, because that's how the law evolves, right? Um, Correct. Y- you kind of find out that some law didn't anticipate the consequences of the language, and then it needs to be changed. And that's why we've got legislatures and uh, uh, the laws are changing you know, constantly in every state and, and federally as well. So here's what's going on. A uh, wife of a U.S. man was killed in Jordan in, in, in a November terrorist attack and is placing the blame on social media. Uh, the lawsuit was filed uh, Wednesday uh, in U.S. District Court in uh, the North, Northern District of California, and it claims that, quote, for years Twitter has knowingly permitted the terrorist group ISIS to use its social network as a tool for spreading extremist propaganda, raising funds, and attracting new recruits. Uh, the person that was killed was a 46-year-old contractor. He was in Jordan. His name was Lloyd Carl Fields. And essentially, um, it goes on to say that it, uh, Twitter is used to recruit new, uh, new members. Uh, YouTube is used as well. And the extremist groups uh, tweet video showing the gruesome beheading of American photojournalist James Foley. And that gained widespread attention. Uh, and then the, the more your aggression against the Muslims, the more our determination and range, uh, revenge. Time will turn thousands of supporters of the caliphate on Twitter and others to wolves. And that comes from the Islamic State. So that's, they're using ISIS to put that out. Turns out that there are roughly 70,000 ISIS-related Twitter accounts. A- at least 79 of those are <coughs> official. And ISIS tweets 90 times a minute on Twitter. I believe 90 it. times a minute. And they also use Instagram. Uh, yesterday, you know, I was watching uh, CNN, and, and in between uh, the news on Sarah Palin and Donald Trump, they, they threw in you know, some news on some, some actual news. And, uh, you know, it, it was called Jihadis, and it's on Instagram, and it's this stylized kind of video that's put out on technology that's developed in the United States by a U.S. company, and many of them are from Northern California, which is a very, you know, kind of liberal place. And ultimately, um, you know, they're using Instagram to recruit people for ISIS and this caliphate that they believe uh, is in existence, where they're going to fight the final uh, uh, battle against uh, the, the West and, at that point, uh, establish Islam uh, uh, throughout the world. And so the reason that these companies are immune comes from Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. And it says, quote, no provider or user of an interactive computer service, so like Instagram or Yelp or or Twitter, shall be treated as a publisher or speaker of any information. So bottom line, they're not responsible for content in any way. And as it stands right now, the people that are policing this are the companies. And, and I guarantee Instagram and Twitter, they don't endorse this, this behavior or these messages. But what they're saying is that they don't have the resources to curtail this information, and therefore they're trying their best, but they're not responsible uh, ultimately for what's going on. Uh, if you go back to 1917, there's something called Trading with the Enemy Act, and it suspends all forms of trade or communications with persons in enemy territory. And the problem is is that it talks about countries, so it, it's hard to extend to terrorist groups because they're not countries. And then we have uniting and strengthening America by, by providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct terrorism which Patri- is better known as the Patriot, Patriot Act. Act. <laughs> That's why <laughs> Patriot Act is easier to understand. And, and that could be used, but it hasn't been. So the idea was is that the Communications Decency Act has been very valuable. I mean, it, it's allowed the Internet to flourish. I mean, our country is the leader in this technology, and the First Amendment is, is flourished as a result of all these ideas that are, that are being placed out in the ether, so to speak. But I don't think we intended this technology to be used by a group of medieval, crazed terrorist individuals that are beheading Americans, beheading uh, those from Great Britain and, and our allies, uh, going to Paris and killing 130 people in a cowardly way, 
uh, with AK-47s blowing themselves up, uh, trying to take down our planes, to being responsible for 9-11. And these guys are using our technology and, and to recruit people. And the companies have no responsibility at this time because of the Communications Decency Act. Um, my sense of it is we need to relook at this. I, I just played Ted Stevens for you, uh, who in 2006, a leader in the Senate uh, on the technological issues, believed that the Internet was made out of tubes. And I think one of the reasons we don't have any movement on this is a lot of these guys are in their 60s and 70s. They're from, you know, the people that are leadership, you know, are from uh, the South, most of them. They don't really have much experience with technology. I mean, a lot of them probably don't even use Twitter or, you know, or Instagram or any of that stuff or Facebook. Because <laughs> they don't, <laughs> from the South. <laughs> Well, the but, thing. But, no. Well, the thing is, is that you, you, most of the technology has been developed in the state of Washington, on the California, east and west coast, and then we've got yeah. Boston. I mean, we've got Massachusetts. I mean, those are the places that, that that are the hotbeds of this. Los Angeles. So you know, it's nothing to take away from the South, but they're, they're simply not the the ones that are the progenitors of, of this. Right? No, I'd agree. They're, they're not. I know. I'm just cotton gin. Around, yes. Yeah. Uh, internet. No. What was interesting, though, with regard to the Communications Decency Act. Uh, a lot of the other, one might say, Western countries, Canada, Japan, the vast majority of other countries, don't have a similar statute, and therefore they don't have those protections. And that's why all these companies are based in the United States, because they have that protection here. And, you know, if you want to go out and hold a company responsible for things that are posted on there that, in this instance, yeah, are quite uh, you know, objectionable, then you're asking them for... Uh, you know, patrolling their own content because they're going to say, this is okay, that's not. And if they're doing that, can they then take refuge by the Decency Act if they're actually now de deciding what is appropriate conduct? Well, I mean, think about this. Um, back, you know, before we had the Internet, um, you know, really the only way that you could ma mass produce an idea, you know, back when we were growing up, I mean, we, you know, when I was in my teens, there was ABC, NBC, CBS, and, and PBS. That was it. Yeah, and, and magazines and, and, and magazines, print. But, I mean, uh, talk about it, the way to reach a mass audience essentially was limited to four networks. Yeah. And could you imagine during World War II that NBC was uh, allowing Nazi Germany to put out propaganda uh, against the United States? It wouldn't have happened, period, end of story. Oh. So how is it that we get to – I get to watch jihadis on Instagram with the stylized – videos and they're recruiting people that want to kill you and me and they, they want to kill our allies and they're perpetuating these unbelievably heinous acts of cowardice and they're using our technology to recruit people and, and, and there's no recourse at this point and, and we're the government is doing nothing to say hey look um you know, you, you got to do better or there's got to be something that can be done because recruiting people on our technology that we're paying for, it, to me, needs to be looked at. I, I don't know the answer to this, but I know the answer is different from the one we got right now. I got, you know, for a long, long time, it was like smoking. You had everybody on TV smoking. Your parents were at barbecues smoking. They were saying, hey, most doctors recommend, you know, Chesterfields with regard to smoking. And then the anti-smoking campaign came out. And if your friend comes over and he wants a cigarette, he goes to the far corner of the yard now to light up and have a cigarette because it is the campaign has been so good over so much time. The opposite should happen. Instead of 90 uh, things a minute coming out from ISIS, they should have 120 on the opposite side and just, you know, have a bigger voice, have a much better message than they do. Yeah, but, but when you watch these individuals, the, the reason is not a currency that they trade in. Uh, bottom line is reasonable messages do not work with individuals that believe that apostates need to be beheaded, that if you're Jewish or Christian, um, you're, 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 we won't kill you, but you're, you're going to be enslaved as long as you accept um, what's, what's happening to you. I mean, that, that's the interpretation of the Koran of these people. Correct, and that's why you have to get well-recognized well imams and other individuals on that side that are, that are you know, respected to come out and say, hey, you're looking at this in the whole wrong light. But, but bottom line is these, these guys don't speak for Islam. No, they don't. Uh, my, my brother used to live in Indonesia, and that, that is the largest uh, Muslim country in the world. They're, these people and they just bombed are, it. Uh, yeah, these people are unbelievably kind and gracious, 
and, and, and live what's in the Quran as I see it. Uh, one of my friends in uh, Thailand I spent some time with, he, he's Muslim, married to a Muslim woman. It, 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 Islam is not ISIS. ISIS is basically a, a gang that is taking oil, taking money, taking slaves, raping women. That, that, that's not a religion. That's just a gang in the name of religion. But the point is, is that even the Google's head of ideas, who's Jared Cohen, says, look, something needs to be done about this. And bottom line is we got to take them off the, the websites that we use, which is the, the, the general public's website, and put them on the dark web, which is Tor, T-O-R. Mm-hmm. And it's much more difficult to propagate jihadist messages, according to Jared Cohen, if we, if we do that. So even the, the head of ideas at Google recognizes this is a problem. Well, yeah, it's, it's a PR problem for them because, you know, people might start turning away from Twitter, turning away from certain, you know, of these entities that republish. But what I did like and I did notice with regard to the lawsuit that they filed, the language that they used, I mean, you cited the first part, social network, for spreading the extremist propaganda. And then they also said this material support has been instrumental in the rise of ISIS and has enabled them to carry out numerous terrorist attacks. They actually used the word material support because when you go back to that 2010 case of Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project, there's, that's the counter-argument to the free speech idea, because in that case, the justice has upheld the federal law that makes it a crime to provide, quote, unquote, material support. So they actually use that language uh, or that, you know, that two-word sentence, material support, to bolster their case. And whether or not Twitter wants to take the uh, first step and, uh, you know, start abiding by their own content, the court might decide that they have some liability with this, and then it no longer becomes – you know, should we or shouldn't we? Anybody sitting in a boardroom that just got sued for mal- you know, for wrongful death and is held liable, that is going to have resonating sound in every boardroom in any one of these publishers. Yeah, so, so here's the thing. Bottom line, 100% support Silicon Valley, Northern California, all the technology. We're leading the world in this. But I, I, something needs to be – somebody needs to look at this. Uh, and it's going to be very interesting. I think they're going to file a summary judgment motion under 230, Section 230, the Communications Decency Act. Agreed. It might get thrown out right off the bat, but it's going to be interesting to see what happens. And perhaps this will spark a debate, and maybe we can change the law a little bit to make sure that this uh, kind of propaganda is not uh, put out. Yeah. All right, so we'll come back. We'll go ahead and talk about common carriers and Greyhound, all things legal. Join you in a bit. All right, we're back. This show is All Things Legal. I'm Craig Ashton of Money 105.5, the Wall Street Business Network. Essentially, we are personal injury attorneys who distill topical events into their legal essence. Uh, we know that personal injury is a pretty, na- pretty narrow topic, so uh, we try to broaden our horizons. Just got done with a, a heated discussion about uh, whether or not the law needs to evolve uh, in terms of making sure that our enemies are not using the, our technology uh, against us. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a very nuanced discussion, and it's not, it's not easy it's easy to understand that the ISIS message is reprehensible and needs to be stopped. Yeah, there's no doubt. It's about harder that. to understand within the confines of the freedom of speech, the First Amendment, and then the way that the internet has evolved. Whether or not uh, we we want to put any responsibility on the companies because then it will stifle uh, free exchange of ideas. I mean, you hear the comment all the time. I may not like what you say, but I'll fight to the end to let you say it. And I'm kind of on that side of it. But in this instance, the court may make the determination, i.e. the jury, if this becomes a question of fact, for a jury to decide if this constituted material support under, you know, uh, the law as it exists currently. And if it does, it's going to take care of itself. Yeah, I mean, you would have to prove, I guess, that they're aware of every one of these tweets and then allow them to continue. Yeah, and that's the other thing. How do you do that? That would be hard um, because, you know, it's a lot lot of information, and I I don't know technologically how you'd be able to monitor this if you could, if they're doing, what, 90 tweets a a minute or something like that. Well, if you identify a certain account, you just close it. But how hard is it to open up a new Twitter account and then restart doing it again? It just – it's tough. Yeah, I I don't know the answer to that other than I think it needs to be looked at, uh, and I I, – you know, I don't have the answer to this from a legal perspective, but it is a legal issue, and it's a, it's a legal question, and it's whether or not the common uh, the Communications Decency Act has gone too far in cases like this, whether or not the First Amendment extends far enough to protect this sort of interchange. But these, you know, these are pretty much fighting words, and these are enemies, and okay. fighting words aren't protected. Defamation is not protected. There's a great documentary. It's called Spy Masters, 
and you could almost argue that just the opposite. They could actually use all these Twitter feeds to actually track back and find out where these people are to, and another, you know, shut them down and uh, however they may do that. Yeah, understood. So, uh, you know, when I when I just saw that just the other day, I figured, you know, I'll do a little research on whether or not there's some history regarding what we do with essentially assisting enemies and whether or not their acts that might apply. And really, there aren't any. And it's the uh, Communications Decency Act that really kind of applies in this case. So, so we'll see where this goes. Yeah. We'll kind of keep you apprised. All right, so let's go ahead and switch gears here. Um, uh, tragically, on Tuesday, a Greyhound bus driver uh, crashed uh, just outside of Gilroy, uh, killed two people, and uh, he stated to the CHP, uh, quote, he stated that he did feel fatigued and that he did get some coffee in Gil- Gilroy when he dropped off two passengers. So that's going to be in the police report, and, and that's hearsay, but that's a declaration against interest, interest so it's probably, yeah. probably going to be admissible. Um, one of the passengers said uh, he could feel him weaving and jerking the wheel a little bit, and I knew it wasn't going to end well. Uh, the California Highway Patrol examined the scene. Also, the uh, National Safety Transportation Board came to the scene, and uh, clearly liability is going to be clear. Um, you know, if you're nodding off, weaving and it's a single car accident and you hit a uh, safety barrier, <laughs> um, even under the law of negligence, if he, he was just a private citizen, um, clearly he's going to be responsible for the medical expense, lost income and pain and suffering. Yeah, the guy had a duty to drive safely and failed. He breached it. For the, the death cases, the uh, wrongful death statute says that the family members are entitled to the loss of love and comfort. So the relationship becomes relevant. Uh, some people you know, don't like their parents and they send them a lump of coal for Christmas and others are super, super close, right? So the law wants to look to see what you really lost in terms of loss of love and comfort. And then support usually is for the wife or the children. So if the person that passed away was the main bread earner, then you get a forensic economist involved and come up with the present value of the loss of income over the course of their work life expectancy. So if they're, you know, 40, then they maybe have another 30 years of work life expectancy. You multiply that by uh, the amount that they were making, uh, account for inflation, et cetera, come up with a present value, and then you add that to the loss of love, comforts, and support. Um, the California and the rest of the United States r- recognizes what's called common carrier responsibility. And common carriers are held to what, quote, uh, under jury instruction 902 in California, common carriers must use the highest care and vigilance of a very cautious person. So what that means is because they're entrusted with the lives of many, many people, we as a society have recognized that the law of negligence simply doesn't suffice because these are professional drivers. Yeah, they're actually taking a fee or a fare. And so because you're paying them to carry out an act, you want them to do that with, as the instruction says, must do all that human care, vigilance, and foresight reasonably can do under the circumstances to avoid harm to passengers. So that would apply to Uber, to Lyft, to Greyhound, yeah. uh, to airlines. Uh, would apply to Amtrak, trains, Amtrak, the so, RT, you name it. Uh, whoever you're giving money to, that's professionally employed to do that. And we're not talking about if your kids driving their friend to school and they're chipping in for gas. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about somebody that's actually licensed and a professional. They're doing this as a commercial endeavor. So the, the, the driver pretty much admitted to the officer that he was feeling dr- drowsy. Uh, there no, doesn't appear to be any other vehicles involved. So from a foundational liability perspective, that's pretty clear. Um, I kind of did a little bit of research just to figure out, you know, about tired driving. Because everybody knows, like, texting and driving is dangerous. Uh, everybody knows drinking and driving and using drugs is dangerous. Uh, but... Apparently, according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, uh, they estimate that 100,000 police reported crashes are the direct, direct result of driver fatigue each year. And this results into 1,550 deaths, 71,000 injuries, and $12.5 billion in monetary loss. Uh, the groups that are usually most responsible for fatigue driving are adults between 18 and 29. Uh, men are more likely to drive drowsy than, than women. And uh, according to the study uh, uh, for traffic safety, people who sleep six to seven hours a night are twice as likely to be involved in a, cr- in a crash uh, as those sleeping eight hours or more, while people sleeping less than five hours, uh, risk, uh, their risk goes up four to five times. So bottom line is, you know, 
it's important to be rested. And if you are driving fatigued and ultimately becomes one of the reasons that the crash occurred, then you're going to be negligent and you're going to be responsible for the damages that you cause as a result of, of that tire driving. Yeah, here, you know, right now here it is in California, the Greyhound bus. But there was that big case just, what, a year, year and a half ago, Tracy Morgan. And uh, the uh, that truck driver, the yeah, FedEx Walmart. driver. Yeah, Walmart driver apparently did not have very much sleep when he got on the road because the, they just kind of pieced it together. So it is a real thing. Don't don't kid yourself. If you're tired, get off the road. Take yeah, a it's cat nap. Super important. I mean, think of it. You, if you can just pull over, uh, you know, sleep for half an hour, mm. or 15, even 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes a big difference. I, one time I was driving to my parents' house in uh, Ventura. And I just pulled up side of the road and slept for 15 minutes. I felt so much better and because it, I felt like I was about ready to fall asleep. All right. Well, when I moved up here, my wife was still in Southern California. I was driving down every weekend and driving back. And I was always pulling over, taking a 15-minute nap. But the Because uh, if I go half hour, I'm going to be tired. I'm in the middle of a rent sleep, and I'm never waking up. If I, so I just do the 15-minute and move on. It felt so much better. And, and, and when they're talking about this 100,000 police-reported crashes, right? Yeah. So – I, I would say the majority of accidents are not reported to the police, uh, or, or I would say at least an equal number. So if, if you have 100,000 that are police reported, I'm wondering how many actual accidents there are that, that total, be, adding the ones that go unreported. Well, yeah, because – and that, that article you gave me, it's according to data from Australia, England, Finland, and other European nations, all who have much better reporting with regard to the questions they ask drivers with regard to whether you drowsy or not – indicate that 10 to 30 percent of all crashes are due to sleep deprivation. Yeah, so that, you know, it's oh. not, not something you really think about much, but in the last uh, you know, year or so when you're talking about uh, Tracy Morgan and the Walmart yeah. crash, now Greyhound, and those are, um, you know, the Walmart driver's not a common carrier because he's driving a truck, but he works for Walmart. So under the concept of respondeat superior, he's an employer. Walmart's responsible for his actions. And then you have the common carrier issues in regards to uh, the crash uh, with the Greyhound. Um, and these are the ones that get reported, uh, it's potentially a, a significant issue. Well, what about, remember the train that went off the rail uh, on the uh, Boston? Uh, yeah, going like 80 cur- miles an hour. 80 or, or 100 yeah, miles an hour right. to that curve. They were wondering whether or yeah, not that guy was trousy or fell asleep, you know, the conductor, as the human backup. So hopefully if you're driving, you're listening to the show, you're not finding it. <laughs> <laughs> Wake up out there. Exactly. <laughs> or as Emerald Lagasse would say, bam. <laughs> That's funny. All right. So uh, basically the idea is, is that don't uh, sleep and drive, obviously. And if you're tired, pull over <laughs> and get, get eight hours of sleep or more, and then you'll, you'll basically don't be Don't even fall asleep in a again. Google car. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Or, yeah, that, yeah cause that train went off the rail. Think about it, man. You've got to be awake, even if you're in an well, autonomous vehicle. Yeah, and it's funny because we talk about that. You know, the, the, they're passing federal rules now. Google, we've got Audi using a racetrack outside of Woodland where they can actually test the car at real speed. So the day will come at some point, uh, assuming that the technology is good enough, uh, whereby uh, you don't have to worry about these issues because if you fall asleep behind the wheel, you know, Hal's driving and you're not and you're fine. Or yeah. Surrey is driving. Yeah, yeah, but that was supposed and to happen. And if you talk in your sleep, you may end up somewhere you don't want to go. <laughs> oh, that would be bad. <laughs> <laughs> you get a call. Where are you? You were supposed to be home hours ago. <laughs> I don't I know. know. I fell asleep, talked to my sleep. Somehow I ended up in Tijuana. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, because last night I watched The Martian, a great movie, uh, by the way. And uh, so the technology that they had was actually pretty good. I haven't fully seen it. Is it a comedy? Because that's what it won for. Uh, it's not a comedy. It, it's essentially uh, Matt Damon's character uh, dealing with the solitude and the despair of being left on Mars without a food source. Uh, but he says and, and he, what he, he does is he uses humor to get himself through it. OK. And uh, it, it, he, he says some pretty funny things about he's a uh, botanist and he comes up with a, a way to perhaps uh, I won't give anything away, but he tries to grow some food. I won't say whether or not it's successful. <laughs> but uh, bottom line, he uses a lot of quips and kind of lighthearted sarcasm to get him through the process. So it, it's a built-in mechanism to help him cope. And I, it's not meant to be slapstick or funny based upon the theme. It's just meant to show this is the personality of the guy. But, you know, he is pretty humorous. Okay, so it's more cerebral humor. Yeah, because I think the Golden Globes, he won, they won Best Comedy. Which <laughs> like we were saying, yeah, getting stranded on Mars for uh, – 586 souls, which uh, they call days on Mars because they're slightly different time frame than uh, uh, those on Earth, um, I don't think is a subject for mirth. Yeah. 
Yeah. I'd go though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, if you know, if you get locked out of your car for an hour, it's you know, think about getting stuck on a planet. Oh, oh God! When I worked as a state lifeguard in Honey Beach, people would always walk up and say, "Excuse me, but we're locked out for car. Is there anything you could do to help us get in?" And the one guy I worked <laughs> I'm with, writing it, a comedy. Hey, yeah, the one guy I worked with always said the same thing. You know, there's a big rock over there in the parking lot. Just put it through the window. <laughs> yeah, <I know> that. <laughs> <laughs> our our, our uh, paralegal Doug, he's a, a great surfer. Uh, he's an outdoorsman for sure. And I think he was on a first date. He took his uh, girlfriend up to this very isolated area. And I think his beagle may have been, or, or maybe his uh, uh, Boston Terrier was in the car. And he ended up locking his keys in there. And he, Hey, he used the rock. He, he used, used the rock. <laughs> he used the rock. <laughs> it works, folks. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so he rocked that. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, he ended up marrying that girlfriend. So uh, it all worked out for him. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, all right. So, w- w- when we uh, come <laughs> he, back from the break, he literally got her a rock. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go ahead and talk about zoning, uh, the Tenth Amendment, and Airbnb, and some of the new rules that uh, have been instituted in Sacramento. And we'll all right, we're back. This is All Things Legal and Money 1055, the Wall Street Business Network. Hopefully, uh, enlightening you and essentially stimulating you so you are not doing any tired driving if that's what you're doing. Uh, we just got done talking about tire driving and common carriers, and now we're going to switch gears to Airbnb. If you're not familiar with Airbnb, this is a uh, company that you can access uh, via the Internet, uh, and you basically just type in what city you're going to, and you'll see a listing of private homes or apartments or condos, etc. cetera, and uh, you can go ahead and rent them from Airbnb, uh, then through the owner, and uh, ultimately it's a lot less expensive in many cases than a hotel, uh, stayed in a great place in, uh, uh, I think it was Cal de Strat, which is a, uh, a township outside of uh, Barcelona, uh, about maybe 20 miles or so, uh, kind of a medieval place with, uh, you know, cobblestone streets and crazy uh, narrow alleyways, and uh, it got, had a lot of flavor, and I think it ended up being, uh, there was three of us that stayed there, about 100 bucks a night per person, and it was probably a million-dollar place, had a beautiful view, wow. great kitchen, great sitting area. Uh, and just a really good experience. So the point is, you know, I endorse this option. Uh, you know, hotels, you know, Four Seasons and places like that have their place. But in Airbnb, if you're looking to go, you know, with friends and you've got, uh, you want to hang out with some people that you really like and have a glass of wine before you go to bed, um, you know, in, in a uh, environment that uh, is conducive to conversation and uh, kind of brings you a little bit of that euphoria that you get when you're traveling to a different spot, Airbnb was a really good experience for me. So... Essentially, the idea is, is that uh, zoning allows for restrictions on use of property. Uh, Ed, Ed was talking about uh, Folsom, where we live. Uh, he looked on Airbnb, and there's a couple houses that are for rent in Folsom. Oh, yeah, houses, rooms. But there's really nice uh, Victorian down in Old Folsom. But you, what you want to do is if your next-door neighbor has got an Airbnb, you <laughs> kind of want some restrictions. I mean, during spring break, you don't want to have 16 you know, teenagers at, you know, next door going nuts, right, with toga parties. Yeah. I mean, you might. No. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's kind of weird, you know, like I said off the air when I first saw this, I'm going, why does the uh, government have to get involved with you know, some commerce on somebody wanting to rent out their house? But at the same time, I moved into an already zoned residential neighborhood, not a commercial right. or a mixed use. And you know, I'd be taken aback if all of a sudden the house next door to me was being rented out on a regular basis to you know, individuals you'll never get to know, uh, i.e. your neighbors, things like that. And being loud, maybe recognizes, who knows? It's, I can see why you would want some semblance of, uh, you know, uh, ruling on this. So the Sacramento City Council unanimously approved two ordinances uh, this Tuesday. And the ordinances require Sacramento operators of short-term rentals to obtain a permit and pay associated taxes and fees. The changes respond to a quickly evolving part of the sharing economy. Uh, Airbnb representative Jeff Dorso said the company approves of the ordinances. Uh, previously, renting out a spare room or an entire house fell under the category of bed and breakfast, and you needed a special conditional use permit for that, and uh, they can cost around $5,000. So under the new category of short-term rental, uh, which was approved Tuesday, short-term rental owners would still have to obtain a business operations tax certificate and pay the city a transient occupancy tax, which is 12% of the room charge, but they are exempt from condition, the conditional use permit for the bed and breakfast. The new ordinance also requires the city to notify all neighbors within 200 feet that a permit has been issued, and it set, sets a six-guest limit, which seems to be reasonable. Yeah, I, I would agree. So this goes back to the Tenth Amendment, which says that any power that's not held by the federal government, the states can exercise. 
And this is kind of a police power issue, which is, hey, look, we're, for the health, self, safety, and welfare of the residences, uh, we are going to essentially limit some uses of property uh, within the confines of what's in the best interest of the health, safety, and welfare of our citizens. Uh, the first case was a uh, village of Euclid, uh, Ohio versus Ambler Realty. Uh, Ambler Realty uh, wanted to have their properties commercial, which they can make a lot more money on. Uh, it uh, got zoned as residential. They ultimately sued uh, as a taking under the Fifth Amendment, and they lost and said, basically, um, this is really under the law of nuisance. Two rules. First, the zoning extended and approved on nuisance law in that it provided advance notice of certain types of uses, which is uh, fair. Yeah. Uh, you know, if they're incompatible, then you're going to be restricted. And the second argument was that the zoning was a necessary municipal planning instrument. And if those two elements were met, then you're okay. Um, one of the great lines came from the U.S. Supreme Court, justified the ordinance saying that a community may enact reasonable laws to keep the pig out of the parlor, <laughs> even if pigs may not be prohibited from the entire community. Yeah. Um, having a pig. <laughs> that makes sense then. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, if you're living in an apartment, you say, hey, I want to have a pig, uh, and there's zoning against having livestock in your apartment, you can't have the pig in the parlor. But if you live out, you know, I have 1.25 acres, and uh, it, it's it's okay to have a pig. Yeah. So, so the point is, is that there are certain restrictions based upon nuisance and the health, safety, and welfare that allow restrictions on the free use of property. Uh, how's the pig get wrong with the cattle you have in the backyard? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get a miniature llama. I'm just worried about the, uh, the landscaping. Um, so the, the idea is, is that if it goes too far, then you could institute the taking clause under the Fifth Amendment, which means that if the government takes away your right to your property, then they have to give you reasonable compensation. Uh, but zoning laws have been found to be constitutional because they don't rise to the level of taking. And so that's basically the Airbnb and what's going on in Sacramento. And, and the nice thing is is that uh, they kind of work with Airbnb, and ultimately their representative endorses it. Uh, my experience with Airbnb has been great, and I think those are reasonable accommodations. And it just shows you Sacramento's really kind of you know, making some really interesting, I think, cool strides towards becoming a – 21st century city. I mean, I never even thought of Airbnb until, you know, you brought this issue up for the show today, and then I looked into it. I'm like, that is an excellent idea if you go on a trip someplace, yeah. uh -huh. check the Airbnb and all the accommodations that are out there. I mean, I was really surprised. It was super simple to do, too. A little bit of deposit. You know, it ended up being like 100 bucks a night per person instead of, you know, much more. And the, the only issue is when, when you get there, there's, there's no uh, um, food in the fridge. And when you're driving a nine-passenger red minivan on medieval roads trying to find a supermarket in a 10th-century uh, township. That's when you go to Uber. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, to, that part was a little bit challenging. Fall back to Uber then. And uh, But, yeah, Airbnb, 100% endorsed. So the last topic, which we'll just uh, touch on. So basically, C Camilla D. Harris, who's the attorney general of the state of California, is investigating whether or not uh, Exxon – basically engaged in securities uh, fraud. Um, the Loretta Lynch, who's the uh, Attorney General of the United States, uh, basically hasn't looked into this like California is. Also, the Attorney General of New York is also looking into whether or not there was some securities fraud. The idea being that you have to disclose material information to your investors, and Exxon being a publicly traded company, apparently going back all the way to 1977, uh, had information from their own investigators that carbon uh, into the atmosphere was leading to climate change. And right now you're seeing the ramifications of that. I read today in the business section that uh, uh, the coal industry, I think they're, they have lost 94% of their market cap. It's gone from $68 billion down to $4 billion. Uh, as a result of that particular fossil fuel falling out of favor, and it's very expensive to pull out of the ground. Now oil's at 28 bucks a barrel. And it looks like the coal companies are be may become dinosaurs of the past because we're just simply saying the, the cost, the overall cost of using that sort of technology uh, is having a detrimental effect, and it's going to be very expensive to clean that up. So the idea is, is that there's an investigation going on, and if they fail to disclose material facts that they knew of, uh, then there could be a, a cause of action filed by the state of California for securities fraud. I mean, but they also have the, and I, a lot of people don't agree with it, but they're going to take the stand that it's not a settled 
thing that this X causes Y. That's the idea. And, and the uh, um, cigarette companies did the same thing. And they, and, they, and they had to cut a deal at some point to say, look, we, we, will, we will pay these fines and we'll put these warnings if we you limit our liability. Yeah, the thing with the cigarette companies, it was amazing because back then when they said, hey, it's a billion dollar settlement, nobody ever heard of a billion dollars back then. A, a lot of them just a cost of doing business. Goldman Sachs just paid a $5 billion fine and they just they have a cost of doing business. They go, hey, we're going to make more than that. We get caught, we pay it. So the point is, is that that's interesting. That's moving forward. Airbnb is moving forward.
Oh, yeah. Made, uh, you know, the dean's list over at Oklahoma State. Nice. Congratulations, Zach. We'll be working for you someday. <laughs> Yeah, I noticed in that article that the law in the state of New York, you didn't have to show an intent to defraud much lower. You know, oh, right. That's why I pointed that out. Much lower standard, much easier to prosecute. All right. I'm going to get a change I want to add. 60 years experience, two iron men. Let's keep that one off for sure. Two. I'll let 100. Yeah, we got 100, and now we've got, I've got five. Or a century. You want to see a hundred or a century is worth. Century. A century. A century is worth. Well, let's hope ISIS wasn't listening because they're probably going to kill me at this point. Nah. <laughs> you just tell them that hey, there's no such bad, no such thing as bad press. I just gave you some. Thank you. 